me well? Yeah? Um, welcome to CDOP. Um, for some of you, welcome to Barcelona. Um, it's great to see a full house and to see so many friends and colleagues uh, that are interested in the issue that we're going to be discussing today, violent extremism in, in municipalities, <coughs> in, in urban centers. We are honored with the presence of two distinguished speakers, which I will introduce in a few minutes, Ambassador Jorge Descayar and Mayor Bart Sommers. Um, as you probably know, some of you who are registered here for tomorrow's event, this is a two-day two event uh, that has been organized in collaboration between CDOP and the Handel Center for the Study of Political Violence and Terrorism at the University of St. Andrews. Um, there are still places for tomorrow if you want to come and attend. We have uh, an impressive uh, number of speakers. Um, if you cannot attend and you only want to listen to some of the panels, uh, you can follow the event on streaming. And before I introduce our two speakers, I want to say four, I want to mention a few things about the current threat uh, of Salafi jihadist terrorism that Europe is facing. The first one is to simply to contextualize the amount of attacks that we're currently facing. A simple reminder that from 1970 to 2017, the number of attacks has increased exponentially. 150,000 attacks have taken place during these almost 50 years, and half of those attacks have taken place between the year 2000 and 2016. So that's half the attacks. This increase in the number of the attacks has also affected Western European cities, mainly, and as you all know, the list of urban centers that have been targeted by Salafist jihadis is now too long to remember in order. We have Madrid in 2004, going through Brussels, Nice, Berlin, Stockholm, Istanbul, and so on and so forth, and ending in Manchester and London um, a few days ago. So terrorism is no longer something that happens over there, it's something that happens in here, and what, what we want to discuss in the next two, day, two days are what are the drivers, what are the explanations <coughs> that drive this increase in violent extremism or terrorism in our countries and ways in which we can make our streets and our neighborhoods safer. The other point I want to make, and that's uh, in order to contextualize what we're trying to do here, is that one can detect a paradigm shift in the kind of strategies that early cities but states are carrying out. We no longer talk about counterterrorism. We no longer talk about countering violent extremism. We talk about preventing violent extremism. extremism. So law enforcement agencies are now expected to prevent, to stop attacks before they take place. And this is much harder to do than simply um, sort of implementing sort of hard power or security measures against um, the threat we are currently facing. Of course, any initiative at local level will have to be harmonized. It cannot go against what's going on at the regional and state level. So it is very important that whatever we discuss in the next uh, few days um, can, be, can be combined and that is not mutually exclusive. So in order to combine this national and supranational level and the local level, we have these two speakers which I will now proceed to introduce. To my left, your right, uh, we have Ambassador Jorge Descallar, who is a diplomat with a distinguished career. He was Spain's ambassador in Rabat, in Morocco. He also um, was in Washington, D.C., and uh, the Holy See in the Vatican. Um, very relevant for us today, he was the first civilian to head the Spanish intelligence service, the Centro Nacional de Inteligencia. And he was directing this center when Spain had the uh, 2004 Al-Qaeda inspired terrorist attacks. He explains all this in a, in a book of his, which I have here. Um, very good book. A very good book. <laughs> and I recommend you all read it. Um, and I hope that he will tell us a, bit, a little bit about this uh, sort of national, supranational um, element and how the intelligence services play a role. And to my right, your left, we have uh, Mayor Bart Sommers. Um, he is, in case you don't know it, the best mayor in the world. <laughs> and I'm not saying this because I like him, be because I do, but he's actually the best mayor in the world. He won the 2016 World Mayor Prize. And the reasons uh, have to do with how he 
made Mechelen great again, to paraphrase <laughs> Donald Trump, by developing a, a strategy uh, of uh, making the city inclusive to all citizens of the city. And there's no distinction between those who have been there for generations and newcomers, in addition to sort of improving the, the security measures. That's all I wanted to say. The structure we will follow will be uh, the following one. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to present their case, and then we will open uh, the questions uh, to the floor. The reason why we're starting on time, by the way, the reason why we're doing something this revolutionary is <laughs> not because I woke up in a revolutionary mood, but because one of our speakers has a plane to catch later tonight, so we'll have to finish at 7.30 sharp. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me express my gratitude uh, to Thidob for this invitation, <coughs> and to Professor Muro particularly. Um, Jordi Bacaria and Abo Rui, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here in Barcelona and to be back in, um, in Fidop after, after a number of years, I must say. But I'm glad to have this, okay, to this opportunity to come. Well, I've been asked to uh, put this seminar sort of perspective, explaining which are the main um, um, geopolitical trends which help to explain the world as it is in 2017. Como se dice en castellano, poner un poco el toro en suerte. You are going to have two days of discussions about terrorism. I'll talk about, I'll speak about terrorism. But, but before that, I'm going to try to explain, I mean, what's, what's happening in the world nowadays so that we can, you know, sort of to have a Christmas tree and to be able then to put the ornaments. But we have a strong uh, uh, branches. <coughs> and I do think that there are four aspects I'd like to, to stress here. The first one is the um, acceleration of the tempo historico. Things are happening very fast, um, every day, so many things. Um, uh, uh, there is a beautiful sentence by Arnold Toynbee years ago who said that the, the dust raised by the galloping, the, the hooves of the galloping horses of history uh, does not allow us to see with clarity what's happening around us. And I think it's, it's very true. We spent thousands of years you know, sailing, and then in just 63 years, uh, is the lapse of time between the moment when the Wright brothers fly a few meters above the, the ground to the moment when Armstrong reaches the, the moon. No? If any of you is over 45 years of age, which I really doubt, you have seen the, the population of the world double during your lifetime, which is amazing. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, the world reaches one billion people during uh, Napoleon Wars, and now in, in 45 years, the other day, uh, I have a granddaughter, who, who, she is five years old. She had been studying uh, the prehistorics at school. And she came back home very excited, say, um, explaining, you know, the evolution theory and everything she had been taught, and asking his father where I was a monkey when young. So things are happening very fast, but maybe not so terribly fast. Well, it is the, the main, the first element. The second one, is the, well, and that explains that we are at the end of a historical time. I, I think it's a cycle which is ending. Historical cycles are shorter and shorter. The, the, um, the world of Vienna lasted 100 years, the world of the uh, Second World War is ending now, after 10 years, uh, after the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, of um, uh, American hegemony. But this world, this uh, bipolar world, is ending uh, right in front of our eyes now, and in that explains uh, the uncertainty we'll have to face in the coming, in the immediate years. And then we have three uh, main uh, elements. The first is the, so to speak, the, the American withdrawal, something which began with, uh, with Obama. Obama was there uh, at the time, uh, the, the day of his inauguration. He, uh, he came to power with uh, the idea of withdrawing the truth from the Middle East, you know, uh, tackling with the economic situation, and then maybe health reform. Um, but he uh, um, created uh, uh, a term, uh, is a, um, a strategic restraint, we can talk about that later if you wish to, um, explaining this withdrawal uh, of the United States. Well, this tendency has been accelerated, it's evident, with Donald Trump. He believes the international political and economic order is contrary to the United States interests, has a narrow vision of those interests, protectionism, economic nationalism, national security, interest, wh whatever, you know, protectionism. I'm not going to dwell into that. Does it mean that this is the end of the United States um, hegemony in the world? 
is not the end of the United States, certainly. 4.3% of the world population, 24% of the world GDP, 40% of the world uh, um, um, military expanding, but and soft power uh, um, very, very strong. But it's creating a vacuum. And this vacuum explains a lot of things happening now around us. It is the end of the US leadership in the, in the world. And I'm afraid that the world will not be uh, safer if the United States withdraws from international organizations and the world will not be richer if we elevate and uh, we uh, build uh, walls uh, uh, of protectionism. The second element is the crisis that Europe is going through. We have 9% of the world population. We have 21% of the world GDP. We have 15% of the world trade. And we have 50% of the show social expenditure in the world. We are envied, but it's expensive, difficult, because we're constrained between uh, lower salaries in I Asia or in, in Africa and cheaper energy in the United States or, or the Middle East. President Janker said that we are in a going through an existential uh, uh, crisis, be it political, institutional, economic, uh, um, social, aggravated certainly by Brexit, at the same time Brexit will provide us with a great opportunity because you're going to raise the, the, the weight of France, uh, making the difference with Germany, you know, and, uh, and balancing the, and the power of both uh, main elements in the European Union. But the, the influence of Europe in the world is diminishing. There is an interesting study by the Elcano Institute um, in that respect. And I do think we have a great opportunity, we can talk about that later in this very moment, to tackle our, our uh, future. And the other element, the third element, is the United States, Europe, and then the emerging of new powers in the world. Uh, imagine that back in 1960, Europe and Japan and the United States gather 60% uh, of the, 70%, sorry, of the world GDP. Now it does not reach, it's around 50. In 1975, the French economy was four times, the it was double the economy of China. Now it's a fourth of the economy of China. By the way, the economy of the, our GDP is equal to Russia. Uh, um, Russia is playing well beyond uh, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, um, theoretical capacity. Um, the problem is that these new countries um, reaching the state, I mean the stage, uh, the great theater of the world, as Calderon would say, um, want to play the main roles. And the main roles are being played by the actors. And... Um, these people, or these, these countries, have different values um, on gender, on the role of religion in public life, on the individual. <laughs> and they tend to reject the institutions we have inherited from the Second World War, which run the world nowadays. The Security Council, the United Nations, the World Bank, the uh, International Monetary Fund. Um, was the reason the UK should be a, member, a permanent member of the Security Council and not uh, India? also nuclear power and uh, 1,300 million people, or why China should have the same voting rights in the World Bank as Italy, for example. No? These countries demand protagonism and a greater share in the wealth of the world. And um, it poses the question of if we will be able to escape the Thucydides trap. Uh, Thucydides uh, study years ago, uh, in the French and uh, the, the Greek uh, years, uh, 16 cases in which emerging powers out of 16 cases in 12, uh, the, the rise of new powers ended in war. Um, and you can imagine, I mean, what happened with the, uh, with the, with the formation, the nation, of, or the, the birth of Prussia in the 19th century, for example, which is a closer example than we have. Uh, Bannon, the, the Stephen Bannon, the, the um, um, advisor to President Trump, believes that a war between the United States and China is inevitable. In the in the coming years, no. Well, this is uh, in this in this this all happens in the context of globalization, which is creating wealth at at, at the world, uh, you know, uh, in good macro uh, macroeconomic figures, but local zones of poverty and growing inequalities. Um, the future will be shaped uh, in this world, and uh, uh, with three elements playing a great role: population, the technological revolution, and uh, I cannot dwell on that, and the the growing importance of politics over economics, I think, uh, of economics over politics. I, I think that's very serious uh, because some important decisions are 
uh, not taken in a democratic framework, but imposed from uh, economic uh, um, uh, instances. Uh, for example, uh, um, um, lim uh, budget limit. In this world, there are crises, uh, local, like Libya, like Korea, whatever, and there are global crises. One of those global crises is terrorism, and I'm coming down, coming down to, to that. Um, we no longer have an nihilist or um, ethno-nationalist uh, terrorism or, mm, you know, um, whatever, the, the anarchist, uh, but we have jihadist terrorism. And that's a very serious problem because it derives from a very peculiar interpretation of Islam, and I do think uh, that Muslims are the main targets of those um, things of what happened in Kabul just a few, a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Why this terrorism turns or uh, takes the West uh, as a target? Why they aim at us? I think um, there are many reasons for that, but um, uh, Avi Eshlein, which is a Jewish scholar living in um, London, um, he has uh, spoken about the post-Ottoman syndrome. Um, which is, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, you know. Um, it says that it's this post-Ottoman post syndrome creates an anti-West reaction. Why? Because, uh, and this is not uh, obvious line, it's not, um, this is, um, uh, why? Because uh, on the one hand, they feel at least doubly cheated by us. Once with the Sykes-Picot agreements, um, which thwarted the dreams of liberty of the Arab peoples and the promises of the Wilson 14 points or the uh, um, Lawrence of Arabia, mm, you know, for that matter. Um, then uh, when, the, um, when the Arab Spring again channeled, I mean, the aspirations uh, to dignity and, and freedom uh, has been again frustrated and we are again supporting um, dictators that we have during the... Th th there is a um, Palestinian poet, Barghouti, he says that the price we paid for our independence was dependence. Dependence was the price we paid for independence. And that dependence goes on until now. Um, Al-Sisi is the new dictator in Egypt. He's been supported and, uh, um, you know, there's no difference with Mubarak um, or the Shah or, or, or Ben Ali. Um, then... Um, they attack because um, they feel a need to avenge uh, um, suffering and the failure to enter into modernity. They have imitated uh, our political and economic models and that has given them corruption and inefficiency. Um, they want to avenge our intervention in Syria or in Iraq, the, the, the fellow with a hammer who attacked two days ago to a policeman in Paris uh, was uh, shouting something about Syria, apparently. No? Uh, this is for Syria. They want to show resilience, which is important. They want to boost morale for the troops in a moment of great predicament. And they want to strike back in a moment of asymmetric, uh, in, in a war, uh, in asymmetric war. And it's true, there is a resurgence of terrorism but not only from 19 uh, or 2000, uh, uh, there were many deaths back in 1980. Um, I do think that from 1915, the last two, three years, we have seen a big research uh, in, in the a big increase in the number of murders. Um, other years were 204 in Madrid, 205 in London, but then had been a sort of a valley and now we have. Um, uh, in our case, in the case of Spain, uh, um, I think we we haven't had a, a problem in the um, in, in recent years, and um, I do think that we have um, a good experience um, forged in the years of our fight against ETA. Uh, no matter how different this kind of terrorism is uh, from the one we used to be familiar with, but um, we have a problem because w Spain was dominated by the Arabs and it was a Muslim land for many years. And um, some of them believe they should recover one was they one day was uh, belonged to them. And um, I was saying that I was in the um, Libyan minister house no longer um, years ago uh, when Gaddafi was alive, and the foreign minister had a map 
and half of all of Spain, half of France, Italy were painted green the same way as it was painted green, you know, Algeria or Morocco or, or Egypt or whatever. So uh, they feel, uh, and there are references to Al Andalus in uh, at least in eight or ten recent communiques by Al Qaeda and uh, even references to Ceuta and Melilla. Um, the use of cheap methods like cars or um, a hammer or a knife, um, anyone can get one of those. And the use of local terrorists, people born and bred in, um, it's a lethal combination. It's, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to detect. Um, then there is a support from religious circles, even states. There are accusations these days to Qatar open accusations by Saudi Arabia. Probably it's forged, probably it's not true. But the fact is that it's a lot of money poured into uh, um, uh, extremist uh, groups. Um, the other day I read somewhere that the, the Brits had, had under surveillance 20,000 people. And uh, they had an open uh, um, investigation on 3,000 of them. It's extremely difficult to keep track of all those people at the same time. The limits are what well they are. I mean, uh, are not illimited. And uh, you need many people and a lot of effort to be able to track and to follow so many people and the, at the same uh, times. Of course, uh, recently we have seen there have been some failures, some errors have been committed. Um, information has not been uh, duly, uh, um, uh, duly uh, taken into account. Um, you have to check those fail, you have to debate on that. But I'd like to, to talk a moment about cyber terrorism, which I think is a great, very important threat to. Um, we created back in 2004 the Centro Criptologico Nacional, we're doing a great job, I might say now. Um, but I remember that Panetta, when he was um, director of the CIA in Washington, told me once that uh, he was more worried um, about uh, cyber terrorism than even terrorism itself, you know, because of the potential danger. Um, and I'm rather skeptical in this field, you know, there are no good fellows and bad fellows, I think, are those who can and those uh, who cannot. But those uh, who can and who do it benefit from distance, um, opacity, the difficulty to trace them back, and they represent a terrible potential danger because they can interfere with uh, critical network with hospitals with they can destroy harvest they can even uh, manipulate with biotechnology methods uh, viruses and create pandemias uh, and th the possibilities are uh, enormous and um, and it can put uh, literally put a country on its knees i remember that back in two years ago uh, an uh, was uh, an outage was provoked in ukraine where uh, 600,000 families were left without electricity. Uh, imagine that in the midst of that, of that cold. And this uh, cyber terrorism is increasing exponentially. Uh, in the world, uh, there were in 1914, 64 major attacks. In uh, this year, we expect over 700 in two years' time. Um, uh, you've seen what happened the other day with uh, WannaCry, uh, this uh, virus. I'm not going to, um, to dwell on that. But 150 countries affected and 300,000 computers taken hostage and uh, asked uh, uh, $300 in ransom. In Spain, uh, we had in, in uh, last year 115,000 attacks. And um, and that is exactly more or less double than in 1215, in 12-15. Which means it's increasing very, very fast, and, the, and, the and it's very difficult to combat because it's terribly expensive. Uh, uh, you know, the technological edge is, is, is changing, uh, and um, you need highly trained personnel. It, it's complicated. Uh, which what's the greater risk at this moment um, is, uh, well, we have a number of, of risks, but uh, what worries more is that um, Al-Qaeda and both uh, ISIS have shown interest in chemical, biological, uh, radiological and nuclear uh, um, capacities. Um, they have shown interest. Now, um, they have not used them until now. Why? Uh, it's difficult to know, but maybe because they're complicated to manipulate. 
because their in inability to weaponize, to transform, the, to transform these uh, um, instruments into weapons, or because it's because of self-restraint, because they are afraid of something they are not going to be able then to control. Uh, but the fact is that the risk is there. Sarin has been used in the past, anthrax has been used in the past, and that's not impossible to... Um, are Al-Qaeda and ISIS getting closer now? I've heard something. Uh, I think there are extremely important um, uh, doctrinal and personal differences between them. But ISIS is in a very difficult situation, so it wouldn't surprise me if there is some... Well, I don't know. Hopefully not. Um, but they could also find inspiration in the, this recent WannaCry uh, attack. Finally, the fight against terrorism is a mouse and cat game. Um, that's the way uh, um, terrorists have the advantage of choosing uh, how, when, um, what, where. They decide on that. We all learn. Uh, we are learning and adapting our techniques. We have been able to pass from combating ETA. When, 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 when um, remember that apartment in Leganes uh, was blown up uh, the, um, and the last members of the Madrid commando uh, killed themselves. Uh, an agent of police was killed at the same time where he was trying to force the door to that apartment. We were prepared to fight against ETA. We were doing that all the time. But we were not prepared to find people inside who were going to blow the whole house up. Um, so it, it requires an adaptation on our part. And we are doing that. Um, many Many terrorist attacks have been uh, have been thwarted, have been prevented. Uh, the Brits say the other day that at least 16 over the last uh, three years, and, and probably it's true. Um, we keep on here in Spain. Uh, people are being detained on a weekly basis. You can see that. On the but it's best wha one one time you fail, and it's a disaster. So no matter how many things you have prevented, it 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 only takes one failure to um, spoil the whole thing. The have that they use knives on cars is a success to a certain point of the security and intelligence forces um, because they are preventing from obtaining other uh, more, um, uh, more um, lethal, uh, uh, lethal methods. Uh, but there is no uh, zero security and that uh, we have to learn to live with. It's impossible to control 20,000 suspects at the same time. It's very difficult unless you give incredibly, uh, m you know, um, more means to. Um, because they will always keep on looking for softer targets. If you Now, I've seen that the London Bridge has been uh, uh, the pedestrian area and the sidewalks have been separated from the, you know, the area where the cars can circulate with the big, uh, um, uh, um, I don't know, barriers. But you cannot put barriers in all the streets of London. And if they, you have all the situation on the barriers, they go to a celebration of Real Madrid. Oh, sorry, Real Madrid maybe is not a good example here. But um, um, to um, whatever, you know, th you will always find something where you can, uh, where you can uh, uh, um, a softer attack. The fact that they are looking for softer, you cannot attack parliament. Okay, you will go to a neighborhood uh, uh, restaurant. If we wait for them, we will be late. Th th that's, that's, that's also extremely, uh, extremely important. Prevention is essential, as, uh, as, uh, as you said. You know. uh, then the uh, work of the intelligence service become of paramount importance. The control of the Internet, um, maybe changes in legislation. I don't think changes in legislation sh should be made in a moment you know, of, of the difficulty of predicament. It should be well mm, thought of. Uh, um, in a moment of peace of mind. Um, I do think the public awareness and support are very important. I remember that when I was living in the United States, usually it would very uh, frequently I would understand on the loudspeakers of the airport saying, if you see something, you say something. If you see something, you say something. Well, uh, neighbors uh, are watching those eyes, you know, in some, in some residential areas. Um, it's important uh, cooperation of the, of the population. And then global threats demand shared security. No difference anymore between, between domestic and international terrorism. You can uh, steal a um, mobile phone here. With that mobile phone, you go and make a call, and then another fellow gets a credit card. And with a credit card in a different country, you rent a car, and with that car, you go to another country. You have a small 
crimes. You cannot do anything against that. But you have the whole picture. You have a, a terrorist network and you can act. Uh, you need the full picture. So we need more international, I mean domestic uh, coordination. There's always room to improve that. And uh, you need more international uh, cooperation. But always remembering that, as I said before, I mean, uh, total security does not exist and will not exist unless you want to live in some Orwellian world. And I'm afraid that um, in the, this tension between civil rights and security, security is winning. Security is winning. And, and we have to do our best in order to preserve uh, our, our civil rights um, and get security at the same time, but not renouncing to our principles, to our way of life and our... And our um, uh, one uh, liberty. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Ambassador, for thank keeping to the time. Um, what you were saying about the threat of cyber terrorism um, uh, reminds me of the fact that sort of military always say that the, the army are prepared for the last war, not for the war they have to fight. It seems that the intelligence services are no different to that from what you were sort of uh, commenting. Uh, Mayor, you have your 20 minutes. Okay. Let's first of all say that I'm very uh, honored to be here uh, as a mayor of uh, Mechelen, Malinas, uh, a city in Belgium between Antwerp and Brussels. And uh, first of all, I have to say that being a world chosen world mayor, that's a poisoned uh, present because everything that goes wrong now in my city, even a street that's dirty, they say, oh, is it possible because you're the world mayor? So uh, I have to create a paradise or people are not happy anymore. And Mechelen is not a paradise to start with that. Uh, why uh, did we get with, as a rather small city, a little bit of international uh, attention? I think there are two reasons for it. First of all, you have to know, 15 years ago, Mechelen, uh, Mechelen is a city of uh, 86,000 inhabitants, 131 different nationalities, super diverse, one out of two kids born in Mechelen have a foreign background, 20% of the people living in Mechelen are m from Muslim uh, belief, most of them Moroccans from the north of Morocco, from the Rif uh, area, the most vulnerable group for, for radicalization, one of the most vulnerable groups for, for, uh, for radicalization, violent radicalization. So a very super diverse city. And 15 years ago, it was also a city with a very bad reputation, very polarized. I, with the elections, 32% of the people voted extreme right. Uh, it had one of the highest criminality rates at that moment. So middle class left the city. It was a city with a low self-esteem. Uh, and now it's seen as one of the reference, reference cities in Flanders. Uh, for example, the appreciation of the integration policy is the highest of, uh, of, of my country. Uh, extreme right has less than 8%. Uh, and uh, the culture is much more open and tranquil than, than, than before. So there is a big change and, and everybody says how how did they do it? And the second, even more important, concerning the theme of today, is that uh, Mechelen is in the center of, you could say, a bigger agglomeration of three million people. And out of that agglomeration, Antwerp, Brussels, nearly 10% of the European foreign fighters left, 8 to 10%. There are 4,200 foreign fighters, and 10% uh, came out of that region, out of the EU. Two, 200 out of the Brussels region, only 20 kilometers away from us, 100 out of Antwerp, only 20 kilometers north of us, uh, 27 out of Vilvoorde, which is a very small city, five, eight kilometers away from Mechelen, and out of Mechelen nobody left. So statistically, that doesn't fit. So everybody wonders, how, how, how did they do that there? Uh, of course, we had some luck, and knock on wood, because when I speak, mo somebody could leave. But everybody start asking why, why, what, what's happened in Mechelen that, that you made that possible. Uh, how, how did you manage that as a city to try to change that? And, and to explain that, I have to start with two inconvenient truths. Uh, after listening to a lot of uh, interesting professors and, and other people uh, and, and, and going around in Europe to, to see models of, of how can we cope uh, violent radicalization, we have to, to see two inconvenient truths. First of all, it's, it's already mentioned, if the, the number of radicalized people, of violent radicalized people, is uh, growing, it becomes impossible, maybe it's already today impossible, to follow, follow them all. You need 10 to 15 policemen to follow somebody very closely. And if you hear the figures of people who, can, who are potentially radicalized, it becomes very difficult to control it. And the second thing is that once somebody is radicalized, 
to de-radicalize somebody. And bringing back to, let's say, our society, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, uh, and success is not guaranteed. You cannot, you cannot promise somebody that, that you have a machine, uh, you can put him in, and after two weeks or two months he comes out and he, he comes out de-radicalized. So what do you have to do? You have to prevent people getting radicalized. That's the most important thing. And, and uh, there is still uh, a growing common sense that we have to focus on that. How can you prevent getting people radicalized? Difficult thing, but the key answer for that is an inclusive policy. Make people part of this society. Make them citizens. To say it a little bit boldly, recruit them for your society. Then they will not be recruited for others. Because if people are part of a society, believe that they can, can be citizens of this society, that their future is in this society, you gain two things. The attraction of a totalitarian alternative will be less big, will be not so big anymore, because they feel okay with the society they live in. They can have critics, but they will not choose a radical alternative anymore. And secondly, there will still be people choosing a radical alternative, but in their environments, there will be enough people feeling citizen of your uh, society, having trust in, in, in a mayor, in the police, in the security services, in the social workers, to go to them and tell them, I think we have a problem. My brother, my friend, somebody in the sports club, somebody at school is having strange thoughts, strange ideas, and we have to do something with it. Because they will know that they will be seen as citizens and not as enemies, and that the society in a first uh, reaction will try to help and not to put people in the corner and, and see them as, as somebody, somebody they have to punish. And the strategy is always the same. It are vulnerable people. People, why do they radicalize? Eh? Because we cannot understand it very well. It's, 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 it's uh, crazy uh, that, that you are prepared to give your life to kill other people. For, for what? But it's a story of zero becoming hero. Somebody who has a very complex situation is at the bottom of society. He has uh, done them bad, uh, and then he can give uh, his life a new dimension. He can restart again as a, as a hero, as, as a, in a very simple black and white world, uh, like a video game. Uh, and and, and he's, uh, he can make a big gesture, he can write history. All those things come up, and that can attract people, certainly vulnerable people. People who are vulnerable in what, whatever way. And, and how can you prevent it? I think that the basic method we try to do is to bring in, in a very early stage, when they start, still are open, that there still is an openness for, for, for discussion, bring in people they still trust, they respect, they want to discuss with, they still listen to, and try to stop the radicalization process and bring them on other thoughts. Show them that there are alternatives. And that is, in fact, the method to do it. Now, the big question is, how do you include people in a society? Because that's a slogan, but how do you do it? And also for me, I had to think about it because I have the honor to, of being a mayor for 17 years. This long before the caliphate, there was already the, the, the Mufti Bart Somers in, in Mechelen. Uh, so, but long before that, we worked on a strategy to, to fix our city. Not, not, of course, not with the idea that there will, will be at a certain day something like ISIS. Nobody could predict it. But what we did before, helped us to protect us better than, than maybe in, in, in other places. And what is the, the strategy? And it's, it's 10 points, and I've been very sh short on it. First of all, take safety issues uh, serious. We invested a lot in safety, in police, in fighting uh, normal criminality. We didn't want to have neighborhoods where kids grow up with the idea that the police is the enemy, that drug dealers are the role model, that you can buy stolen goods in shops, that there is no respect in the public domain, the, the streets are dirty, full of graffiti, schools are dirty, no parks that are clean where you can play, uh, where, where the rule of law doesn't exist, but there is a kind of rule of jungle. In such neighborhoods, people who grow up there can imp impossibly identify themselves with the society they belong to. They are not part of society. They, they have the feeling that the, the society can, can be the enemy. And, and I strongly believe that where criminals can, can rule the streets, extremism will follow. Because there is a gap, there is, uh, there is an emptiness. 
What are, the, what are our values? What is our ideology? The state isn't it, because the state is the enemy. The state isn't here, so the, is there something else? And then you have extremists who, can, who have the possibility to recruit. So I think that's a very important thing, and, and we did it sometimes. We were strict. I, was a, I am a strict mayor. Sometimes even used the word zero tolerance in certain moments. I have a lot of cameras in the street, but never against a community. Always also trying to mobilize people to be part of the security story. For me, it's a social battle. If my car is stolen, it's party time because I'm very well insured. I can choose a new one in the garage. I don't have to pay for it, get a new color. But if you're a poor guy and your car is stolen, at the end of the month, you have no money to buy a new one. You, you cannot go to your, your work. That's a drama. My kids grew up in a middle class neighborhood. There are no drug dealers around the corner. They, they, are, they have not to be afraid of it. But if you, are, you grew up in a poor neighborhood, those drug dealers are a problem. So a security policy is a social policy. And we try to mobilize also people to, bring, to, to help us. For example, we have a beautiful program that's called the Older Brothers uh, Program. In, in, in summertime, we, we recruit job students, young people of our town, that are a little bit the social workers on the play uh, ground. Uh, they, they, they are in, in charge of social control, you can say. They say, don't break it down. Uh, respect other people. At 10 o'clock, a little bit quieter, because the little children have to sleep. And they feel responsible. They get a responsibility. And they start thinking about rules in society. And the younger ones, they respect them because it's the older brother. And society gets another face. It's not a policeman, it's not a white policeman. No, it's, it's Mohammed, our cousin around the corner, who is taking care of business here. And he's the city, he, rep he rep represents the city. One example out of so many. The first thing. So it's not a left or right wing answer. It's, it will be a mixture of left and, and right wing things. We have to think about a new paradigm. Paradigma. So that's the first thing. I think it's important. Without that, why it's also important? Because in your city there will be people who have difficulties with change, who have difficulties with diversity, of the changing reality. If you can give them the, 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 the security that there is at City Hall somebody who takes security issues seriously, then they, maybe they will be more open for the reality of, of every day. So that's also important to get those people with you, because you have to bring people together in, in that new uh, reality. Second th thing, create a new n narrative about diversity. If, if your narrative of your, your, your city identity is based on a kind of nostalgia, of a faded monocultural past that, that's going away, everybody will be frustrated. Let's say the, 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 the original people, because they say, yeah, the past was better, and we, we, we are losing some, something. And of course, the new people, the, the migrants, will also be frustrated, because they can never be part of that identity, because it's not an identity that was there before they came. So try to create a new narrative, a new story about who we are, a new identity. And you have to do that, with, with, of course, with policy, but symbols are also important. One, one stupid example, you will laugh at me, but we have a tradition of, of giants in, in Flanders, big puppets that I, people can identify themselves with, 400 years old tradition. It was a father, a mother, and two kids, all white, of course. F 400 years ago, there were only white people in Mechelen, but now it's a family of six. It's a black African and a North African. It's part of the, the, the story. When we uh, remembered 50 years of migration in Belgium, mass migration, in a lot of places they, they, they remembered it. We celebrated it. We put 125 photos of 125 citizens, all with an other national background, uh, saying that's who we are. We put it in the center of the city, one year long, saying we are proud of that. That's, that's part of us. Another uh, example was when, when there was the attack on, on, on the airport of Brussels, on Zaventem. I went to the mosque on Friday, and there were a thousand people of my city, citizens of Mechelen, who were afraid what will be the reaction, and, and they were also afraid of, of, of course, of terrorists. I went there and I said, I'm your mayor, you are two times victims in my eyes. Once, like everybody else, but the second time, because you are Muslim, you are a victim. Because those uh, terrorists, they hijack your identity, your religious identity, and they make something barbaric of it. So that now you always have to explain that you are not like those guys. And that um, you, 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 don't like, you, you don't like them. And, and you, you are put in the corner. Uh, you have to uh, apologize for who you are. And you don't have to do it because you're a victim. 
So that are moments that you bring people together. Third element, avoid group thinking. That's the fault of the classical left and the classical right. Classical left uses group thinking too often to say that people with a migrant background or Muslims are, are victims. They are discriminated and, uh, um, and, and they, 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 they should have special attention as a group. And right-wing politicians abuse it also to victimize them and to, to say that they, uh, they abuse our social system and that they, they are, they are uh, criminals, in fact, uh, often. They criminalize people. What's the mistake? Because if you do that, you, you think a little bit in a one-dimensional reality because people have a lot of identities. When I'm here, I, I'm a Belgian guy. When I'm in Brussels, I'm a Flemish guy. When I'm in Antwerp, I'm a Mechelen guy. When I was in New York, I'm a European guy. And, and if my soccer team plays very well, I'm a, of course I'm a Belgian then. Uh, and if they play bad, I say, no, no, I'm a Flemish one. Uh, and the same with the migrant. A migrant in my town, when he goes to his family in, in, in Ador, in Morocco, they say, there the Europeans are coming. They see them as Europeans. And when they go to Antwerp, they say, I'm, I'm from Mechelen. And if they speak with me in Mechelen, they will say, I'm a Moroccan, because they, we, we always look for what makes us different from the other one, with the, with the person we speak. So we have a lot of identities, but if you are doing group thinking, you, you, first of all, you say you only see one dimension anymore. It are the Muslims or the Moroccans, and you don't see the other identities, and you make a caricature of it. We, we had a, a youth club, it was, did very good things, but one of the problems was it was a Moroccan youth club. They were always thinking and discussing what makes us different from the rest. How are we Moroccans differ from the rest of the city? So the result was only Arabic music, because you know Moroccans only love Maroc Arabic music, like, like I only love Schlager music. And uh, they only eat couscous there, because we only eat uh, Mulfrit, uh, you know that, uh, for Belgian people. They only eat that in the morning, evening, uh, and, and they all are very strong believers in Islam. There is no difference between it. Like we are all Catholics, eh? we all go to church every Sunday. So you, get, you create a caricature, and there is a, is, is a group pressure, and the social pressure becomes much bigger. And the, most, the, the worst thing is that you don't see the success stories anymore. Because the success stories don't fit in the group thinking. They don't fit in the right-wing group, group thinking and not in the left-wing group thinking. And in my city there is a professor economy, Moroccan, two, two medicines, Moroccans, uh, policemen, teachers, uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs, of course also criminals. People who speak perf perfect Dutch, people who don't speak a word Dutch, and, and, some, and all, a lot of people in between. People who go every day to the mosque, I think they sleep in the mosque. People never go out, they never come to the mosque, and everything in between, like in every community. But we don't see the success stories anymore, and we need the success stories to break up that group thinking. That one dimensional looking to, to, to people. Fourth thing, very important, fight segregation. We speak about the, the, the good thing about diversity. Progressive people like me, we, we love diversity. But in the cities, in a lot of cities, we don't live in a diverse reality. We live in a kind of archipelago of monocultural islands, in, in enclaves. And if you, if you allow that, if you say, okay, that's, that's the, 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 the consequence of group thinking sometimes, say, okay, the people like to live together if, if they have the same origin, and what, what, what's wrong with it? Of course, you cannot forbid it. We are a free country. But if people live in a segregate reality, the problem starts. Why do they get a park and I don't get a park? Why does the police control us and not them? Why do they have good schools and we have bad schools? So if you really want to have an inclusive society, you have to fight to counter segregation at school, in neighborhoods, in sport clubs, everywhere. And that asks efforts because you cannot force people. The most beautiful thing with it, because we, we do not only talk about it, we try to do it, is we created a, an organization, School Insight, where we go to the white middle class people, bring them together and say, why don't you put your kid in that school with a lot of migrant kids? There, we know the reasons. The black swan syndrome, my kid will be the only kid in a class full of migrant kids. And what's with, what with equality? Because I want the best for my, for my, my son or daughter. So what do we do? We say, if you do it with 15 together, it will be not be alone. And we, we guarantee the quality of the school. We will do extra efforts for it, because we think it's important. 
In two years' time, in a small city, we convinced 160 families to change from school. We broke open four schools where completely 90% or more with migrant kids. Now they are mixed schools. And what are we going to do now? Now we are going to attack the white ghetto school. Because that exists also. It's the, the, the top school of, of my city, the college, with only white kids. And we, we bring together Moroccan parents to say, why wouldn't you send your... And we know why. Black Swan Syndrome, it will be the only migrant kid in a white school. And secondly, we don't know what the habits and, uh, and, and they, they are, yeah, it's, it's an upper class school. So we go to the director and say, you have to change. Yeah, but I try a lot uh, I, to, to involve them. I organized a, a cheese and wine evening. Cheese, we speak about Moroccan families. Wine? So try to think, think, think again. So, and now we try to do that. And, and you have to do it on, on, on every, in every segment of your, your, your city. We, we invested a lot in poorer neighborhoods and we, we renewed streets and we, we create parks with the same quality as in the, in the high class neighborhoods. Because, you know, if they renew in such neighborhoods the things, it has to be vandalism proof because they break it up. Yeah, that, that's always the reasoning. So you give a signal to the people that live there, welcome in the ghetto. No, the same quality. And put maybe more cameras on it and, and maybe more police on the street, but it will be the same quality. And what is the effect? Middle class come back, come back to those neighborhoods. And those are unpaid social workers. They bring people together. They have the social capacity to do it. They organize uh, things in the neighborhood. After school, the kids first have to make their homework and then play. And the boy around the corner is also invited because he sits in the same classroom and also makes the homework. And get also a, a chocolate and a, and, a, and, a, and a cola. And first make the homework and I will help you. Upward social mobility starts there. Real integration starts there. Fifth point, we um, have to say and dare to say that if we want to be successful fighting that, we all have to do efforts. It's not a one-way uh, uh, street. When I speak in, in, in Brussels about uh, the, the problems, they say, yeah, it's a problem of integration. They have to learn the language and so on. The third generation. They are born here, their parents are born here, they are citizens, it's their city. We don't have a first birthright against them. My family lives since 1520 in Mechelen, 17 generations. But I'm the first generation that lives in a multicultural, super diverse Mechelen. And I have no more rights than Mustafa, who was born there in 66. It's also his city. So if I go around to uh, the mosque or to a pub or to a, 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 a tea house or whatever, and I ask to people, what do we have to do against terrorists? And what do we have to do to, to get it better integration? They all have the same answer. All different answer, but it starts with the same sentence. They have to. Nobody says, I, should, I can maybe do also something. So we have to say that we, have all, we all have to integrate in a new reality. It's an effort, we all have to do something about it. If you want to have a, a city that is livable and that can fight against uh, uh, terrorist ideas and, and uh, extremism, it's an effort from all of us. Um, six, uh, six point, uh, values. We speak a lot about values. You have to do it, you have to speak about values. The values are very important. Values of uh, where our society is built on. It are common values. It, it gives us all our freedom rights. Equality of men and women, democracy, the rule of law. But what do we see? We see an Orwellian way in the way populists speak about those values. Those values are, not make, are, are, make, are, are, are created to create bridges between people, not walls. They, they are not made to exclude people. They are made to include people. And populists, they transfer those values in exactly the opposite. There was a party in my country that said, uh, to protect our freedom of speech, we have to diminish it. We have to uh, pr uh, forbid some, 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 some expressions to protect it. That's crazy. Also, people say, yeah, we, have, we have a free society, and that's good. Um, uh, diversity is good. But they have to adapt to our habits. They have to adapt to our, our traditions. So that's against our, our, the, the, the essence of our, of our society, which is based on freedom. And freedom means change. The group that changed our habits and traditions the most 
or in this room. It are women. With women's emancipation, you, you changed all our habits and all our tradition. And reaction of men was at that time a zero-sum reasoning. If they will take our jobs, if they go to work, if they go to vote, we cannot decide who will run the country. And what did women do? They asked the same rights on the basis of our values. And it made freedom bigger and made society stronger. And when gay people asked, came up for their rights and asked to get the right to, to marry, what, what was the first reaction of some? If they can marry, my, my marriage will lose value. Are you crazy? Is there are some reasoning again. But the, the, those gay people asked it and demanded on the same, on the same fundamental freedom rights on the basis of our of our society is built on and we saw the we saw the same with workers we saw the same with cultural people who ask cultural autonomy the catalans the flemish and always the reaction was the same a negative reaction and now children out of migration ask is the same they ask we want to rediscuss your, your your tradition and your habits not against our values but on the basis of our values one simple example, M my kids are in scouting. Scouting is very popular in, in Belgium. And they go on holiday two weeks without uh, adults, and that's uh, the fun time of your life. And, and they come a mother to them, and they say, they, she says, I want my, my daughter to go with them, but we are vegetarians at home. What is the reaction of a scouting group in Belgium? No problem, ma'am. Veggie burger, we, we take care of it. We take care of your, your eating habits. But we, uh, how, an hour later, another mother comes, and she says, yeah, we, my daughter also wants to go. Uh, ah, that's nice, but we also have a little problem. We eat al hal at home. Soumission, eh? The caliphate has landed, eh? Impossible, eh? We cannot do that, eh? And if an hour later a Jew comes and says, uh, we eat kosher, that's no problem. But kosher and halal is uh, nearly the same. So that's th these things have to change. I have to be fast. So uh, I will be... Uh, Understand that a city in diversity is attractive if we keep up our promise and our promise of our society is if you work hard, you do your best, you can get a better future for yourself and your kids. Racism, discrimination destroys the dream. So people who speak about our values have to remember that fighting racism and discrimination is an essential thing in a free society. And my last thing is, and then I stop, the big problem today, and we have to speak about it, if a, a guy with a Muslim background wants to read something of his, uh, of his culture, of his religion, re religion, and he goes in a bookshop or he, go on int he goes on internet, 95% of everything he finds is Wahhabist propaganda. And Wahhabism is a totalitarian reinterpretation of the richness of Islam. Every religion has a rich tradition of discussions. As a pluralistic background, we have four schools of law in, in, in the tradition of Islam. They all recognize the others. Uh, Malakids, for example, they, they, they recognize the others as being uh, valid, as being relevant. And they all interpret, uh, have another interpretation of Islam. Wahhabism makes from Islam a totalitarian ideology. Our se security services, that's the last sentence, they have examined that Saudis have invested 73,000 million euros, 73 billion euros, since the 70s in Wahhabist propaganda in Europe. That's more than, the expend, than, than what all democratic parties have uh, spent on, on propaganda for their uh, ideology. And they create a big problem. And we don't dare to say it because the Saudis have too much money. And we have to stand up and say we cannot accept it. To give a very, very, uh, um, very drastic uh, uh, comparison, if Nazi Germany still would exist, and they would spend millions of, uh, millions of euros in propaganda for their fascist ID, would we accept it one hour? I don't think so. But we accept it already for, for decades that the Saudis de re redefine Islam into a totalitarian ideology. And we have to stop them. And we have to reinstall the rich, richness of, and the pluralistic uh, traditions that also exist in Islam like in every other uh, religion in, 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 our, in our society. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so we still have um, 30 minutes of, uh, to, for our Q&A session. Uh, anyone who wants to go first? We have Francis at the back. Thank you very much. 
Just uh, one brief question to Ambassador Descayar. Um, the biggest community of Libyans in Europe was in Manchester, in England and in Manchester. People who fled Gaddafi, who fled after 2011. Uh, what do you think of the attitude of MI5, which is acknowledged, encouraged Libyans from England, from Manchester, who had Islamic links with different Islamic ones, to go back and fight against Gaddafi in 2011 because they were good fighters. This is what they did. Uh, I mean, if our security services are as blind as that, <laughs> then all the other problems pale as well, don't they? I'm not aware of that uh, advice. I can't tell you anything of that because uh, I'm not aware of that. I don't know, frankly. <coughs> well, as we wait for people to organize their thoughts, can I, can I ask you, Mayor, um, the advice you provided is very meaningful. Certainly, it makes sense. But I wonder, is this collective advice or the Mechelen model, if we can call it such a thing, um, is this something that can be applied to a variety of cities? And the second part of the question would be, is this something that cannot work in a large city? Uh, I think that the, the, the basic elements of it, of course, every city is different. Uh, there is, the city doesn't exist. Huh? It's like, like human beings. but. I think the basic elements, I think, you can adapt in every city. And I think, uh, uh, to be clear, of course, also in my city we have radicalized people. We follow nearly 60 people very intensely. They are not all radicalized, but we also even invest in people who, have, for example, have, have broken with their, s or isolated socially, and, and have no contact with social workers and so on, or a difficult contact with them. And even if they are not radicalized, we try to follow them up and, and bring them back in, in, in our society, because we really want to have an inclusive city, but you can do it. I think the mistakes are made. For example, there are cities in, 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 in my country and elsewhere where if there is a problem with, with guys on the street, they say we will speak with the, with the imam uh, they, 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 because he, or, or with the leader of the community. Of course, if you guys make a problem, you have to speak with their parents and be with them. You have to speak with them not as Muslims, but as citizens of your city. So you have to be very consequent in it. And, and when I heard Theresa May react, and of course it are election times, and, and, I don't, and I don't agree with, with the things they said, but one of the things she said is we, we live too much in a separate society. We may not be blind of that. It, 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 it takes a lot of efforts. It's not easy to, to change it. It takes time, but you can do it. You can do it in every city. But then you have to accept that everybody is a citizen, and you also have, have, have to accept the consequences of diversity. It means that they are 100% citizen and they can demand things maybe you don't like, but you have to accept if you want to be a free society. Hmm? Uh, one, one example, uh, the Burkini debate, for example. I, 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 I find that a very, very interesting one, because well, what, what did we say in France and also in Belgium, some politicians, they say, if a woman wears a burkini, I know she's not free. I decide who's free or not. So if you do something I, I don't like, I will forbid it. That's the end of a, a free society. Our, our society, you know, democracy, uh, there's a, an interesting uh, Turkish guy, Atiol, he, he wrote a, a book, A Muslim Case on Liberalism. I'm a liberal, so I le read books, and I see the word liberalism in it, I start reading it. But one of the things he said, he said that our liberalism, but you can say it about our democracy, he said, uh, liberalism or democracy is not a way of li 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 life, it's tolerating different ways of life. So the day you start saying, when somebody wears a burkini and I don't like it, you can discuss with the person, you can try to convince it that it's a stupid idea to do it. But if you say, I will forbid it, that's the start of totalitarian thinking. That has nothing to do with, with, with our, with our uh, values. It's against our values. That's like the communists. Even in the, in, in, uh, in the past communist uh, countries, if you, did some, if you were protesting or you, you were a dissident, they put you in a psychiatric clinic. And what was the reasoning? If you are against our regime, if you don't see the good things in our regime, you have to be crazy. We have to take care of you in a psychiatric league. And that's the same we, are, we were saying about people with the Burkhanian. And more even, 
We were, do you say you're, 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 you're suppressed, you're not free, men uh, oppress you, you have no freedom rights, so we will punish you. You may not come on the beach. So you're, not, you're punishing the victims even. So we become crazy. We, we don't understand our own values anymore. So if you really want to, to make an inclusive society, you have to really protect our human uh, rights and our values, otherwise we, 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 we start uh, coming closer to, to the, 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 the guys we, we, we fight against. The difference, we, uh, the difference we make are our human rights and our values and our democracy and our freedom. Never give that up. And if you think f f out of that perspective to people, on a m not on a, on a frigid way, but in an open way, then you can create a society where people really can belong to. But if you forbid headscarf, you forbid halal, you let not people be buried like they think they, they, they should be buried, because that's against who we are, then you create we and them. And then you, you start, the problem starts. I had a, a beautiful discussion in my city. I said, well, people want to be buried with their head to, to Mecca. Say, okay, let, let's do it on our graveyard. Let, let's make space for that. Caliphate has landed in the in cemetery of Mechelen. We are not going to do that, Mayor, because we have a tradition how we are buried. And then I have to explain that the tradition has changed. That when my parents were, uh, grandparents died, you only could be buried in a coffin in Belgium. But now you can be put in an urn, you can be thrown, thrown out in the sea, you can be buried in a wood, uh, you can they can make a jewel, jewel of your, your ashes and you can uh, take it home. And, and if tomorrow somebody comes and he wants to be buried with his head to the center of the earth, what's the problem? What's the pro but people make a problem of that, because we re react emotionally, irrationally on that. Not, not on the basis of freedom, because if you can be buried with your head to Mecca, it makes not your freedom smaller, it makes it bigger. You get another choice, a bigger choice. So what's the problem? And that is something we, we have, have, have to think about. I'm not saying that we have to throw away our values. I, 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 I'm very in, in support of our values. I, I don't give any millimeter on the equality of men and women. Never. Because that's, that's, that, that's the basis for our freedom of everybody. But we abuse now the concept of values and we make, it, we make habits and traditions and, and laws, we make it fundamental rights. And then we exclude people. And then, of course, people cannot feel citizen. They always will be the immigrant and never be the citizen. So citizenship starts with being honest to your own values and see that the values are created to make freedom bigger and not smaller. And that you can implement in every city. <laughs> okay, great. Right, so we have uh, three questions. Shall we start with that one over there? I'll collect the three of them. for me. I was the last one, but it's okay. Thank you. Um, let me identify myself. Uh, I'm Joaquin Roy, a professor at University of Miami. I just got here, you know, from Miami. I have a tremendous jet lag. And after uh, 50 years in the United States, I still don't know, you know, what country I'm living. I would like uh, you both, you know, you give us or give me some assessment about how the United States is seen, especially right now, uh, you know, following uh, uh, Ambassador Descayar, you know, if we are really beginning a new cycle, do you feel that the United States is making the world uh, safer, worse, more dangerous? I just would like to be prepared going back there. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Paula de Castro and I work here at CIDOP. Um, thank you so much for your thoughts and I have a question uh, for the mayor. Um, I wonder if uh, you can um, explain us, I mean, one thing is the programs that you put on the cities, no? In order to counter and prevent the radicalization. But there's any tension between the city level at the state level, level and how you as a mayor can manage to um, narrow that gap? Thank you. 
Thank you, it's Albert Cramés from International Institute for Nonviolent Action here in Barcelona. Again, question for Mayor Summers. You mentioned during your intervention uh, both the necessity to create new narratives or alternative narratives, and again, the, the necessity to combat Wahhabist uh, propaganda that even can be projected and large to hate speech demonstrations. Uh, there's been a debate here months ago, and from your point of view, or even if Ambassador Descaya wants to intervene, uh, how cities can, uh, what cities can do to uh, prevent online hate speech, the use of social media that intervenes a lot, and which roles can, cit uh, can cities play on that? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to go first? Muy bien. Um, Roy, uh, let me... Uh, uh, let me put it this way. I do think uh, the United States is renouncing to lead the world, not because of lack of capacity, because of lack of will, of political will. I think it's, it's bad. Um, we always criticize the United States when they do things and when they do not think, uh, so it's, it's sort of habit. But um, I do think that what happens with climate, for example, in this moment is extremely dangerous, is harming the image of the United States all around the world. 190 countries agree in that we have only one planet, we have to keep it for future generations, and the, and the president of the most powerful nation in the world saying, well, it doesn't go with me, I don't care, uh, I think that's, that's not good. So the image is suffering, I do think it's really suffering. I don't think the world will be uh, richer if we build up a walls of protectionism, I don't think so. I don't think we'll create more jobs for our young uh, generations. And I don't think the world will be safer if they withdraw from international organization or um, international uh, pacts. For, you know. um, and this is exactly what is happening. Um, the present leadership in the United States, uh, President Trump, seems to believe that the present international order, both in the economic and the political field, is not in accordance with the interests of the United States in the way he understands them. He has a very narrow uh, vision of those interests. I don't, think, um, I don't think that's good for the world now and that's good for the United States. Because this is happening, I mean, uh, Trump is a product of our times at the same time. Uh, Trump is not leading the change, Trump is accelerating probably what's already going on. It's a trend of history. Uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, galloping on the, on the um, uh, bad feelings and, and uh, bad economic situation and fears and uncertainties of many people. And those uncertainties have been created by a world in which, you know, growth is a reality, but at the same time some areas have been badly hurt. The other day I was talking to a, a good friend of mine who happens to be one of the really powerful people in Washington, D.C. He's, um, and he told me something, he said, you know, we were not aware of what uh, the Trump was coming. We were not expecting him. In Washington, D.C., 90% of the voters voted in favor of, of Hillary Clinton. I've been with Hillary Clinton many times. She was probably the most prepared candidate ever in the history of the United States. But she was too much establishment, she, she was not liked, whatever. She didn't win. She won the electoral vote, but she didn't win the election. But the, what amazes me uh, is that we live, the other day I read something about the filter bubble. Uh, we read what we want to read. We, we, there are algorithms sending to us the sort of information we are ready, we want to receive, we want to, want to. So we have a distorted image of reality. And this is extremely dangerous because this is growing, uh, true. It means that people in Washington, this other image is reading the New York Times, is reading the Washington Post, is reading the New Yorker. And they don't know what's going on in the, you know, in the, in the deep United States. So the deep United States are extremely deep, as you probably know better than me. They are very deep. When you go to West Virginia, you go to Arkansas, you go to Missouri, they are really, 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 it's, it's not Washington, it's not uh, Chicago, it's not Los Angeles, it's not Miami. So um, I do think that uh, now we, uh, I'm, I'm going to end, but I, I do think that historical cycles are getting shorter and shorter. I said before that the, the uh, 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 arrangements uh, reached upon during the Congress of Vienna in 1815 lasted for 100 years until the First World War, where four empires were blown up at the same time, the Tsarist, the Ottoman, the German, and the Austrian. Then we had uh, a few years interval, then the Second World War lasted 
with uh, Bretton Woods and uh, Cairo and uh, Washington, I mean, and uh, San Francisco, all those uh, uh, conferences and, and other institutions, the United Nations, the World Bank, etc., lasted until 1889, 90 when the Soviet Union imploded and then the, again the bipolar world uh, went down the grain together with, uh, uh, with communism and other things. Then we had 10 years of undisputed American hegemony that Fukuyama thought, you know, this is the end of the world, you know, this is the, the end of history, he said, you know. This is the Washington Consensus, um, economic, um, you know, the, the ec com uh, market economy and uh, democracy and then and the United States is a sort of uh, gendarme. Uh, and, and now, all of a sudden, that blew up again I, in, the, in the blue sky when the, the terrorist attacks uh, in, in 201. And ever since, I mean, we are going from a multilateral world into a multipolar world, a world based on a strong international institutions where um, you have um, insta instances to solve disputes and conflicts, to a world of tension between countries and groups of countries. And in this moment of transition, we are now. That's why we are catering for uncertainty, or the difficulties, and, and we don't know. And that's what is fostering again this insatisfaction which some people transform into terrorism. Would you like to comment on the multi-level question or the... No, uh, I like Mr. Mayor. Okay. Yeah, I, I've been speaking already too long. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah. Also, to be very short, uh, of course, Trump is, is um, yeah, I follow completely what, what, what you said, but there is, uh, every crisis is an opportunity, and, and as a European, I'm, I'm very happy that he helped uh, Wilders uh, lose the elections in the Netherlands, Le Pen lose the election in France, uh, defeated, uh, thanks to Trump, in Austria, an extreme right uh, candidate for the presidency, and helped to, to destroy alternative for Deutschland because people saw what, what, what it means, a populist agenda, and they said, no, that, that we, we don't know. And I think it creates uh, unwillingly maybe an, a, an a window of opportunity in Europe to, to, to have a new project of an integrated Europe and a European Union. So I see, a, I'm a very pro-European guy, so I see opportunities now that they weren't there uh, six months ago or a year ago with, with Macron and Merkel, maybe a new X in, in that can again uh, give a new uh, dynamic to, to, to Europe. I, I spoke with Mark Rutte, for example, he was very sceptical uh, one year ago and he, he, he followed a very sceptical European agenda. He's completely changed. Uh, he says, no, no, we have to do more. So that, that helps us uh, a little bit in Europe, but of course the overall picture is, is, is rather... Uh, sober, uh, not, not good, rather dark. Uh, to, to answer to, to your questions, uh, we work very good together with the, with the regional and the federal state. We, we get a lot of support, but the difficulty in, an, in a federalized country is that uh, for the police security matters, the federal is responsible, and for prevention, the regional is responsible, and that doesn't work very well, uh, because you need an integrated uh, policy. And like you know it in Spain, I'm in Spain, so you know that there can be sometimes, sometimes little tensions between the re re regional and the, the federal uh, level and that they sometimes have small discussions about who is uh, responsible for this or that in the policy. So that's, that sometimes that's not always easy, but okay, we manage, we know how to do it. Uh, and, and what you say about what can a city do against hate propaganda on the internet, I think that you have to tackle that, I think, on a, on a, on a national, even a European level. But I, I, I also think that they're making the walls higher, that protect you are I is important. To, to give one more example, what I try to do as a mayor, I speak a lot about the fact that nobody left out of Mechelen. I do it for two reasons. I can say it here, nobody listens uh, in Belgium now. I do it, of course, to win the elections locally, uh, but the second reason is much more important. I try to make it a part of our identity, of our common identity, saying we are a city that's different than the others. We have protected our kids. We did it together. And uh, we will prove to the rest of Belgium that living in diversity can be a success, and we will prove that. And that's where, where, where we are proud about. So you bring in the identity the idea that we are all diverse, also in ourselves, and that that's who we are, and that we do it successfully. And then you get another attitude against it, because if you deny 
diversity, you're denying being, being citizen of Mecklen, being who you are. So that's a strategy I try to do on a local level to bring people together and that maybe protects also because you cannot exclude the fact that people in come in contact with extremist ideas and, and, and concepts, but you can make them stronger in rejecting it, I think. Thanks. We have still time for a few more questions. One at the front. My name is Torleif. I'm from Aarhus. I work with the early prevention. And uh, thank you to all gentlemen. I just want to tell, say to you, Bart, I'm so very inspired by what you're saying. What all your words is exactly as you found it in my mind. And I'm very curious to know uh, if how you how you attack this problem with the uh, with the radicalization. Do you have an early uh, prevention approach? Do you have a multi-agency approach as we have in our house? You, you know Benjamin Barber, if, if mayors rule the world. Uh, I, I strongly believe that the urban level will be much more important in the 21st century. And the, the radicalization is a beautiful example of it. Because at a certain moment, we as mayors, mayors of Antwerp, Mechelen and Vilvoorde, all three from another difficult, uh, different party, we, we saw in our streets that there was something happening. We say we have to do something about it. Young guys who are in support with, with ISIS and, and, and say that they love it and that they support it and that they, they want to go there and fight. And we went to the Federal uh, Minister of the Interior uh, and saying to her, uh, we see a problem. And she said, a problem? Which problem? Uh, we had to explain to it, to her. We said, we have to do something about it. And they had no programs. It was new. It was completely new. 2013, I think it was, Rick. And then we said, yeah, okay, what do we have to do? We have to, to, to make, yeah, how, we, we have to understand what it is. We, we have to, how do you, do you detect it? What is it? Uh, what is radical violent uh, behavior? And we started to make a book uh, about it, a brochure, because there was nothing. And at that moment, the regional and the federal uh, government said, okay, it's, it's a problem, you, you're right, because the police is start, starting to speak also about it. We will fund that book. And so the policy started, it started bottom up. And then the federal came and the regional came and they started to, to bring in professors who tell interesting things about it and say we, we know it because we see, we see. And then it started, but it started bottom up. And that's something that's new. Uh, mostly in the past politics starts federal and, and, and go down, triple down. Now it, it, it was uh, bottom up, the, the, the policy we, we created. And we, got, we, we, we recruited people. Who do you recruit? We speak about de-radicalization uh, functioners. What's a de-radicalization functioner? Who is it? is it? Is it a policeman? Is it a lawyer? Is it a pedagogue? Is it a... So we, we had to create new people. Uh, uh, think about it. Well, what can it be? Uh, went, went abroad, went to Aarhus in Denmark because they had a program there. And slowly, with, with making mistakes and so on, we, we found a, a policy. Uh, and that... that but but what you not, may not do is think that you can solve it on a, on a local level or, or in a country by creating, uh, let's say, uh, the Ministry of Deradicalization. No. I think it has to be part, uh, you, you may not instrumentalize all your people with, say, from now on, you are a youth worker, now you, 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 you're, you are a youth worker because you have to stop deradicalization. I don't think so. I think the better approach is you are a youth worker and you work together to create an inclusive society. And so we will stop the, radicaliz the, the radicalization process. I think that's a smarter approach than... Right. Time for the last question. Eckert. I fully agree with the comments of Bart Somos on Wahhabism. However, the problem is not just Wahhabism. Yes, the four law schools you are mentioning have also some stipulations that are in clear violation of our constitutions. Yeah? For example, the death penalty for apostates. Yeah? So uh, my question is, where do you draw, and, and the pluralistic values you are alluding to, they are not basically religious in nature. On the contrary, they were one against religion, against Christianity, and nowadays uh, kind of they are 
still problems with religion. Yeah? So it's really like I think there are considerable tensions. Yeah, I wouldn't count on on religion as 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 for for furthering pluralistic uh, uh, values. So my question is, where do you draw the red line between customs, which shouldn't be of anybody's business, what, what you dress or how you are being buried, and uh, 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 ideological components of uh, uh, religion that are clearly in violation of constitutional uh, 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 laws and rights. Three things. First of all, I believe there is always a tension between a religion and our fundamental values uh, of enlightenment. There is a, an inherent tension between it. It's not only with Islam, I think it's the same with Catholicism and, and, and other uh, religions. But I believe in the freedom of religion. So I believe in the capacity of people to uh, the religious people to accept the values of enlightenment. Otherwise, we have to forbid the religion. So I believe there is a capacity in every religion that uh, accepts uh, the, the fundamental values of our society. I, I'm for myself, I'm an atheist, but I have a lot of respect for people who, who, who have a religious <coughs> conviction. Secondly, um, so where I draw the line, I draw the line to, uh, with, with, with uh, the, the positive law that exists and the fundamental rights uh, we, we all accept, and sometimes there are difficult ex uh, discussions. For example, in my city, women can wear a headscarf if they are a uh, member of the city administration. Because I believe that wearing a headscarf is not an attack on our fundamental values. But I'm against wearing a burqa. Because I think I'm a social uh, human being. And if you wear a burqa, I have no real contact with you. And you also dehumanize your, my, me as a person and not only you, you, you as a person. So I think that's, that's a line I, I draw for myself. And it are sometimes difficult discussions. Uh, separate swimming hours. As a city, we don't organize it. We, we want to give the example. In, in our society, men and women, there is no, also no segregation on sex. So, but if you, if you have a ladies' night that exists, eh? ladies' night, it's not a Muslim ladies' night, ladies' night where to go to the cinema, uh, and I want to go with my friends to have a beer without our wives sometimes, sometimes I want that, because that's, that's also fun. So you may not become uh, crispated on it. You may not become uh, totalitarian yourself, that you always have to do it, that every time men and women do something uh, separate, that is a problem. But you have to create a climate where men and women can meet each other on a normal basis, because I think if you, do, if you have a, a, a society that is completely segregated between men and women, you also dehumanize us, because we are also in that uh, uh, subject. Uh, you, you a part of who I am as a human being is that I can be in contact with men and with women on a normal basis. So it's a discussion, but I don't think we have to give in on fundamental principles. The last element I would give to you is, because why I'm hopeful, uh, we have a beautiful program that we go with, with young people to Cordoba, young Muslims coming out of second or third generation, grow up in a, in a sometimes uh, low uh, educated family, they have a very simple idea about Islam, uh, simple rules, simple uh, ideas. And then they go to Cordoba and they are proud. What they see is not, it's not a simple religion. They see a, a universe of, of, uh, of culture, of philosophy, of architecture, of music. And, and it opens their eyes and it's an invitation to think further. And they learn about Averus, a philosopher of the 11th century, who said there were two ways to find the truth. The holy book or the ratio, your, 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 your mind. And if, they, they don't, if there is a, a conflict between them, you, he said in the 11th century, you follow your ratio, not the holy book, and you reinterpret re the holy book. That's enlightenment. At that time in Christianity, since Augustine, the 5th century, if you taught differently than the Bible, you were burned. So it's told to them. And, and they say, is it true? Wow, what? And, and then the discussion starts and you open minds. I, I truly believe that you can have a very strong conviction, but if you come in contact with philosophy, with culture, with traditions, it opens minds. Not, maybe not from everybody, but from a lot of people. And we need those people to build up our pluralistic society. We have seen the same with Catholics, we have seen the same with Protestants. It's a, the bath of moder modernity, you have, you have to bring people through it. And you have to accept that some, in some things they will differ from opinion. And that's not a bad thing in democracy. Uh, we will also differ from opinion on some things. But you have to prevent the basic rights that guarantee everybody is freedom. And the most difficult thing, I think, is the gender discussions. Because there the conflict is made the biggest. 
and that's used as a weapon against modernity by some. Okay, uh, you may or have a plane to catch back to the paradise, that yeah. is <laughs> Mechelen. So I'm sorry to cut you this short, but please thank, uh, join me in thanking the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.